الفاتحة أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله والحمد حقه كما يستحقه حمدا كثيرا وأعوذ به من شر نفسي إن النفس لأمارة بالسوء إلا ما رحم ربي والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق وخاتم الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين السلام عليك سيدي ومولاي يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته صلوات اللهم صل قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم وهو أحسن القائلين وأصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أم يحسدون الناس على ما آتاهم الله من فضله فلقد آتينا آل إبراهيم الكتاب والحكمة وآتيناهم ملكا عظيما Amanna billahi sadaqallahul aliyyul azim For the purification of the souls, the enlightenment of the hearts, for the hastening of the reappearance of the awaited Savior, ajallallahu ta'ala farajah sharif Enlighten your souls and the atmosphere with the recitation of salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Respected elders, sisters and brothers, salamun alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. This is a spiritual vice that has been highlighted and warned against within the Quran and the traditions of the holy Ahl al-Bayt. It is a plague that has affected humanity with devastating consequences. And it is a state that the Ahl al-Bayt have been subjected against and one that led to the massacre of Karbala. Al-Hasad, loosely translated as envy or jealousy, is a spiritual vice that many human beings have come across and indeed have been reminded about throughout their lives. The recognition that emerges is when we talk about Hasad, often you recognize that it is not confined to a particular school of thought, a religion, or denomination. There are many out there who believe and describe what is known as jealousy and envy. You recognize that, for example, philosophers have spoken about this. Aristotle 
has talked about envy as what? As something which causes pain at the sight of fortunes of others. You find Bertrand Russell comes forward and says, in addition, it causes unhappiness. This is a trait within human beings that is found in scriptures like the Old Testament and the New Testament. For the Catholics, Christian Catholics, it's one of the seven deadly sins. In the Hebrew Bible, unfortunately, when I was looking at how it talks about jealousy, sadly, it says that God the Almighty is jealous because people do not worship him enough. And so you recognize that this subject has been presented in different shapes and forms across different beliefs. In the religion of Islam, somebody comes forward and uses the term jealousy and envy to translate hasad. However, hasad is not envy or jealousy. You say, all my life I've been told that hasad is envy and jealousy. What's the difference? Today you come to the definition of jealousy and envy. They say it is when you look at something that you do not have, a possession or a quality or a characteristic that is within other human beings and you want to have it yourself. That is what jealousy and envy is in the definition that you'll find in what books of dictionaries, for example. Islam says envy and jealousy in that aspect is not hasad. Why? Hasad, in accordance with ulama of akhlaq, is tamanni zawalun ni'mati min al akhirin. It's when you see others having something, it doesn't matter whether you want it yourself or not. You want that blessing, that favor to be removed from that individual. So many times when we speak about envy and jealousy, we need to understand the Islamic viewpoint when it comes to what does it mean? It means when I, for example, I'm a businessman and I look at other people who are successful businessmen, I look at them and I say, I do not want this particular individual to succeed in his business. I am a speaker and I look at other speakers. When I see another speaker, I say, God forbid, that I don't want that individual to deliver a powerful lecture. When I am, for example, a, an engineer, a doctor, in any field, you'll recognize this is a trait that is found across society in different professions, different people's backgrounds. When you look at something that you do not have, but in addition to the fact that you want it, more importantly, you want it erased, removed from that particular individual. And that's why the Quran comes and says that envy, it's not a trivial matter in the definition of Islam. Hasad is serious. وَمِن شَرِّ حَاسِدٍ Hasad, isn't it? Allah says Hasad has sharr, has evil. There are consequences associated with it. The commander of the faithful, Amir al Mu'mineen, wa Mawla al Muttaqeen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. In a famous narration, says Hasad is to Iman what wood is for a fire. In other words, it begins to burn out. It begins to diminish faith and iman. That's why you recognize when you examine history, you will see people who have understood hasad but in a wrong manner and have uh, indeed been individuals who have been influenced by shaitan to want other blessings to be removed from others. A man by the name of Abdullah ibn Ubay. Abdullah ibn Ubay was someone in Medina who was what? Who was prevalent before the arrival of the Holy Messenger, Rasul al A'zam Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. But when Rasulullah arrived in Medina, this man was full of hasad. He said, Why is he taking all the attention? Why are people listening to him? Why are people following him? Therefore, this man, Abdullah ibn Ubay, who was later known as the leader of the Munafiqeen, plotted to kill and assassinate the Prophet of Islam due to his hasad. What did he do? He invited the Holy Prophet and Amir al-Mu'mineen, a number of companions, to his house. And he said, if one plan to kill Muhammad does not work, I will try another plan. What was it? He said, I will make them sit in an area. 
in which as soon as they sit underneath, there is a pit. So they will fall. The moment they will fall, then what? We can pelt them and kill them. And if this does not work, I will poison all the food. The food that they will eat will be poisoned and therefore they will die. Jibra'il descends and says to the Holy Messenger, Ya Rasulullah, this is the plan of this individual. However, Allah says to you, go and sit wherever he asks you to sit and eat whatever he asks you to eat. He will protect you. The Holy Prophet of Islam goes with Amir al muminin and the companions. Abdullah ibn Ubay says, I want you to sit there, Ya Rasulullah. He said, very well. This was where the pit was. The Holy Messenger sits. Amir al muminin sits. Nothing happens. It does not fall. Yes, this man is bewildered. What has happened? I have placed a rug over a hole that should have what? That should have made them fall into it. Nothing occurs. Thereafter, he says, bring the food. When they bring the food, the Prophet of Islam eats. Amir al-Mu'mineen eats. Some of the Sahaba eat. But nothing happens to them. Yes? This man is astonished. Thereafter, he says to his family members and others, you might as well eat from the food. Yes? Before they eat of the food, the Holy Prophet of Islam and Amir al-Mu'mineen would what? Recite a particular dhikr. Yes? That is found in hadith. They recited this dhikr and Allah protected them. His household, his family, his companions all eat and they all die. When they all die, the messenger later tells him what happened. He said, Ya Rasulullah, they had an illness, diarrhea. They all died of diarrhea. Yes, the recognition is there are consequences when it comes to hasad. The realization today is it is one of those moral vices that we must be aware of very importantly because in a world that we live in today, it's very easy to be in the state of hasad towards others. What do we mean? It's argued today it's easier to practice envy and jealousy now than before due to the presence of social media due to the presence of posts and what and the declaration of people of what they own or what they have how many times people place for example what they have achieved what they've gone what they've done what they're being given so it's all out there therefore more people are able to see what you have more people have the opportunity to be envious of what you have yes and therefore we are invited to recognize and to investigate the subject of great importance today because I was asking a number of people how do I know if I am an individual God forbid who is a hasood who is envious how do I know people said I don't know how do I protect myself from it a number of questions exist I tell you many a times it is good that we look for hasanat and to what and to do righteous deeds but there are individuals in Islamic history such as Hudayf and Nu'man this particular individual, a glorious Sahabi of the Messenger, somebody whom we respect, somebody whom we love, yes? Hudayf ibn al-Nu'man was an outstanding Sahabi of the Messenger of God. Why? He was somebody that was given the title Sahibu Sirr al-Rasul, the man who was given the secrets by the Messenger of God. And he was an individual who was devout, who was faithful, he loved Amir al muminin and later was considered to be amongst the closest of the disciples and the companions of the commander of the faithful. Yes, one day this Hudayfa was asked by a particular individual that in Basra, this was later after the sad demise of the messenger of God, they said to him in Basra people are talking about the fada'il of Ali ibn Abi Talib but there are those who have objected and said that there are sahaba who are higher in rank than Ali. Therefore, do not speak of the, what? Do not speak of the Fadal Ali in this way. What do you think? Because you have a special status in the eyes of the Messenger of God. Hudayfa looks at them and says, one Fadila of Ali ibn Abi Talib is greater than the Fadail of all human beings and jinn combined. You ask me, is this exaggeration from Hudayfa? No, because Hudayfa was amongst those instrumental in the day of Khandaq, the trench. He was amongst the, those who dug the, who dug the particular trench, but also was sent to Rasulullah by Rasulullah to inspect as an individual who somehow was able to hide himself, the army, the thousands who had come, Abu Sufyan. So he was sent there after the bravery of Amir al-Mu'mineen, isn't it? 
This Hudayfa was once asked by an individual, you are somebody who is close to Rasulullah. I want one tip from you, someone said to him. One tip, please. Hudayfa looked at him and says, go and read the Quran. The man said, if you don't give me something more specific, I will complain to Allah that you never helped me. I want a tip that will change my life. Hudayfa said to him, if you are adamant, then listen and write. If you want Jannah, then stick to Ali Muhammad. In the recognition that this man knew exactly the path of salvation, Hudayfa said, people were asking Rasulullah, what mustahab things should we do? I was asking Rasulullah, majority of the time, what things I should avoid. He said, yes, it's good that people were asking about recommendations. I was more concerned about protecting myself. I was more concerned about what creating a fortress so that my morals, my akhlaq, my deeds are pure. That's why one of our maraji, may Allah bless his soul, Ayatullah Bahjat, once was approached by a particular individual who said to him, I want a prescription. You know, some of them, they come to us. We are nobody. We are students. They say, give us long prescription of a'mal. We want to feel close to Allah. Yes. This great marja said to him that what? That it is not possible for me to give you one now. Come back later. He saw him insisting time after time. He said to him, if I'm going to give you something, will you act by it? He said, definitely. Mulana, give it to me. I am waiting for that list of a'mal. Yes. Ayatullah Bajat said to him, this is what you need to do. Don't sin, Khuda Hafiz. The man said to him, I knew this already. Sometimes we complicate that which is simple. Yes. In the recognition that the religion of Islam presents these teachings. That is why I would like to look at this subject in detail by asking about eight important questions regarding envy or hasad. Number one, how is it presented in the Quran? What stories are presented in the Quran regarding this? Number two, what is the difference between that which is intrinsic and that which is secondary as far as our behavior is concerned? And is hasad intrinsic or secondary? Number three, how do I know if I am an envious person? What are the things that I would have to display, God forbid, if I'm one of those individuals? Number four, is it haram or is it makruh? Which degrees are haram? If I think through hasad, would I get a gunah or sin or not? Number five, why does it occur? What is the reason that sometimes people are envious? Number six, what is the difference between hasad and al-ayn, the evil eye? And are they the same? Number seven, what are the remedies so that if, God forbid, I am one of those who are envious, how do I utilize the spirit of Muharram, the spirit of getting closer to Allah, positive change, to what? To get out of the state. And number eight, which ayah in the Quran highlights that the family of the Holy Prophet were amongst the most envied individuals, which eventually led to the massacre of the 10th of Muharram. Ulama come forward and say, when it comes to hasad, it comes from the Arabic word hasdal. Hasdal in Arabic means might. A might does what? It burrows into the skin and it sucks the blood. It drinks the blood. They say hasad has this ability to be devastating. If it exists in the heart, it's a form of a sickness of the heart, isn't it? And it's a major impediment when it comes to progression, when it comes to proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran is a book of guidance. It's a constitution of well-being for you and I. It has a number of stories related to hasad. Many times, people speak about the story of Adam and shaitan relating to the arrogance of shaitan. No doubt. They say Iblis was arrogant. Therefore, he did not bow down to Adam. Yet the reason for his arrogance was his envy of Adam. The background behind his takabbur was that he saw Adam being what? Being placed in a state which is higher than his. And that's why he would say, That I, what I should be preferred more than this particular creation of yours. At the same time, Surah Baqarah was named Surah Baqarah because of Hasad. Did you know that? 
the largest chapter of the Holy Quran, the background behind it is due to envy and jealousy. What do you mean? Bani Israel, two individuals, cousins, yes, cousins, they want to marry the same person. So they go, they propose to the same person. One of them is a believer, one of them is a disbeliever. One of them believes in Musa, the other doesn't. When they go to propose to that particular lady, she accepts the believer and does reject the non-believer. The non-believer becomes envious of the believer, decides to kill him. When he kills him and slaughters him, he takes his body to Musa السلام, and says, who has killed this cousin of mine? I can't believe it. Somebody has committed murder. Musa and Bani Israel come forward. They say, we must find the killer of this particular individual. They ask Musa, let your Lord tell us who killed them. Allah says, Inna Allah ya'murukum an tathbahu baqara. Just slaughter a cow. And you know the rest of the story. They would continuously pick and would become pedantic about which type of cow until eventually they found the right cow. And Allah says, strike the cow after you slaughter it with the body of the person who is being killed. And Allah will give him life and he will speak out. But the origin of the crime was what? Was Hasan. Yes, very interestingly, however, when you look at the Quran, you recognize many of the stories have the same background. Subhanallah. The story of Ashabul Fil was also related to Hasad. Yes. This man, when he recognizes that the Kaaba is being visited much more than his temple, he decides to destroy the Kaaba. Yet a beautiful realization that emerges from the Quran and needs your attention, please. And that is two stories in the Quran talk about Hasad and they both have a similar theme. Habil and Qabil and Yusuf and his brothers. What do we mean? Both involve family. Both involve brothers. Habil was killed by Qabil. Qabil was jealous of Habil because his sacrifice was accepted by Allah, but the sacrifice of Qabil was not. The brothers of Yusuf were jealous of the treatment or the way that Yusuf lived his life. Yes. And the way he was viewed by his father, Prophet Yaqub alayhi salam. That's why they plotted to kill him, isn't it? What is the realization that emerges from this story? And that is, you might think that Hasad in, is part and part of society and amongst friends and community. But it seems to start within family setups. From within people who are relatives to each other. From brothers, sisters, parents. In the recognition that sometimes we may understand that it's problematic in our lives, but our actions lead to others becoming envious or the tarbiyah, the upbringing encourages jealousy and, and envy. What do you mean? You say to me, give me examples. In parenting, sometimes what do we do when it comes to a child of ours and they've not achieved well in exams? Today, the A-level results came out. We look at them and we say, you're not as good as that friend of yours. Why? Why has Allah tested me with you? I wish that I had a son like that friend of yours who achieved all A stars. That young man will become envious of his friend or his brother or sister. Sometimes when we have sibling rivalry, we compare, don't we? We say that you are not as good as your brother. You are not as successful of your sister. And that harbors resentment and jealousy between the siblings. Number one. Number two, marital relationships. People say to their wives or wives say to the husband, you're not as good as someone else who is, for example, what? Who is, for example, cooked a particular meal. Yes. Someone says that I said to my wife, I am praying to Allah. And I prayed under the dome of Hussein that one day you'll make mishkaki like my wife, my, my brother's friend or my brother's wife. Yes. In the recognition that these kind of statements create what? Create jealousy in the heart because you'll see that you're comparing people with what? With others. That is why when it comes to hasad, people ask the question, are we born with it or do we develop it? Is it intrinsic or secondary? What do we mean? Ulama say there are things which are habits and behaviors which are intrinsic, like eating, hunger. When I'm hungry, I don't need to be taught that I need to eat. True? However, sometimes I do certain things which are not based on any innate need. What do we mean? Why do people eat haram food, for example? 
Why? Is it because they're hungry? No. It is because of secondary considerations in their lives, impacts, influences from others, which leads them to eat that which is not permissible. What do we mean? For example, they are under pressure. For example, they see that it's tasty or they want to try it. True? Is hasad something that we do intrinsically or it's because we have not understood something? We have not grasped something. Please understand this. Slightly complicated philosophically, but it's very powerful to appreciate. May Allah bless the soul of Imam al-Khumayni, rahmatullahi alayhi, in his uh, famous book, Arba'una Hadith. He talks about this. He says, the root of knowledge is the aql. The root of iman is the qalb. I may understand something, but I may not apply it. What does this mean? Yes. Why do people practice envy, hasad? Why are people envious of the others? You see somebody who is successful in the community, somebody who has something that you do not have, and you wish that ni'mah to be removed and erased. Why? It is because people have not understood and grasped the essence of this creation and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us and what does it mean when it comes to rizq being distributed and favors of Allah being given to some and not others. Essentially, it comes down to this point. Allah ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, The Quran says, there are those whom Allah gives and there are those whom Allah does not give. It is part of Allah's plan. He knows we do not know. Unfortunately, we sometimes struggle to understand why is it that they have something I don't have? Why? And it is not only because of this we become angry, we become dissatisfied, we become individuals who are full of hatred simply because we can't have what the other individual has and therefore we wish for that individual not to have it anymore. The Quran invites us to reflect that this existence is not an existence where you and I are able to appreciate or understand fully the secrets of the creation. That I may not know why an individual is born disabled, why an individual is wealthy, why an individual constantly tries their hardest, but they just don't become successful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Islamic teachings that sometimes you and I want something and he doesn't give it to us because there is a better reason, something that is hidden. Yes, He says to Dawood in a hadith of Qudsi, he says, Oh Dawood, there are those amongst my servants. I keep them rich because if I make them poor, I lose them. And amongst those of my servants, there are those that will remain all their lives poor, because if I make them rich, I will lose them. Lose them means what? That they will no longer turn to religion. Allah is full of mercy and compassion. Rabbil Alameen wants us to go to Jannah, wants us to be saved, wants us to enjoy eternal bliss and happiness. He facilitates this for us, but we do not understand. Sometimes we see people enjoying aspects of this life and we say, how is it that they are going through fun? How is it? Especially for our children and youngsters, there is an obsession with celebrity culture. They see celebrities having everything. Sadly, you see in uh, houses today of our mu'mineen, mu'minat, magazines. Okay magazine, cold magazine, hot magazine, not okay magazine. And these magazines do what? What is the purpose? You tell me. Mulana, don't say it's haram. Give me evidence. I'm not saying it is haram necessarily. I'm saying morally, what kind of environment are you creating at home? You are giving this impression to the child who comes and opens this magazine that this person is dressed in this way, has spent several million for a particular night in wedding, yes, has this car, goes on this holiday. You are sending a message to your child, success is this and nothing else because you are enjoying and not only are you enjoying, when you look at it, there is invariably a feeling in your heart, I wish I have what they had, isn't it? Quran tells us this is disastrous. Qarun 
relative of Musa, had so much wealth that he would have what? People carrying boxes of gold. People carrying his immense wealth and treasure. And he used to boast, this is all from me. People looked at him and said, I wish we had something what Qarun has. And Allah says that there are those amongst the community who said, do not wish for this because this is transient, will go, will disappear. Allah takes and gives wish for success in Akhirah. This doesn't mean that you don't try hard. This doesn't mean that you dedicate as much time as possible for what? For trying to serve your own community, for your family. But don't necessarily make this your utter objective, complete what goal in life to achieve what others have, to have the car and the house and the belongings. There is the I obsession today. I want this. I am not happy until I have that, isn't it? This unfortunately is one of the reasons why hasad nurtures and develops in our hearts when we do not recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has what? has given certain individuals certain things and has taken things from other individuals. And I tell you, this hasad that sometimes develops can be devastating at the time of this wretched individual, Al-Mu'tasim Al-Abbasi alayhi la'ainullah. This particular individual one day had a, a servant, a minister. Minister was good to him, everything was fine. One day a learned man comes, sits next to Mu'tasim and begins to talk to him. Mu'tasim likes him, says, this is really an interesting person, has full of knowledge. I want him to be close to me. That minister became jealous of the learned individual and said, this is not right. That He's getting closer to the Khalifa than me. I have to get rid of him. He devised a plan, devised a plot. The moment you give shaitan access to your heart, I call it the shaitan password. You give shaitan the password to your heart, he sits, begins to give you ideas. How to then go about, yes, to implement your plan. He said to this learned individual, the minister, said, I would like to invite you for lunch. He said, very well. He came to his house. He offered him lots of garlic. He would eat lots of garlic. So the learned man said, okay, no problem. At the same time, the minister went to Mu'tasim and said to him, do you know that this learned individual that's now close to you, do you know how he goes around telling people that he hates smelling what your mouth because it's full of garlic, it's full of bad smell. Mu'tasim said, how dare he? Is this what he says? He said, yes. He said, I will test him. Call him now. So when they called the learned man, the learned man sat a few meters away from Mu'tasim and kept his hand on his mouth. So Mu'tasim said, ah, see, he doesn't want to smell me because what? That minister of mine is right. He wrote an order that killed this man. He signed it, gave it to the learned person and said, go and give it to a servant of mine. The learned person does not know what is in the letter. He says, very well. He takes it. He leaves the room. The minister is outside the room. He looks at the letter. Immediately he thinks, the Khalifa Mu'tasim is giving this man money is raising him, is praising him, says to him, listen, please, I want to have this letter. I'll give you whatever you want. I'll give you 20,000 dinars. He says, very well, I, you can have it. Yes. He gives him the letter, gives whom? The minister the letter and goes. The minister says, but I want you to disappear for a few days. I don't want you to come here for a few days. He says, very well. This man, the minister, takes the letter, takes it where? To that individual, says here. This is a command from, doesn't read what's inside. The man reads it and says, whoever gives you this letter, execute him. He says, come here, beheads him. Later on, Mu'tasim says, where is that learned individual? They say he's away. They call him, he comes. He says, why are you still here? He says, what do you mean? He says, I ordered for you to be executed. He said, I don't know. He said, is it true that you stay away from me because of my smell? He said, no, your minister invited me to his house and what? Asked me to have garlic and I didn't want garlic to reach you. That's why I was staying away. And what? The plot was eventually revealed, isn't it? That's why some people come forward and ask this very important question. This question is key in our lives. And that is, how do I know that I am of those who are, God forbid, practicing hasad in my life? I need a barometer. Let's be in introspecting ourselves. This Muharram, let's analyze. Are we individuals, God forbid, who have these traits in our lives or not? 
أمير المؤمنين ومولى المتقين علي بن أبي طالب صلوات الله وسلامه عليه gives us the first unfortunately characteristic of somebody who is a hasood he says when you see someone having something that you do not have it pains you pain you have pain in your heart amir mu'minin says yakfika an al-hasid annahu yaghtamu waqta sururik when you see someone happy with something that you do not possess you go through anguish. Your heart go through distress. That's the first sign of somebody, God forbid, who is an envious person. Yes? Second, please understand these. These are very important. We need to scrutinize ourselves. If we go through these, God forbid, it's time to what? To shake ourselves. It's time to reform. It's time to change positively. The second is what? The second is we become happy when others go through calamities when people suffer if there is happiness in our hearts due to the hardship of others then that's a sign of somebody who's hasood what do we mean so have you heard of people who um, when they are told somebody is going through a really bad illness they say oh i'm so sorry to hear it but then later smiles maybe there is a problem between them maybe they have disliked them for example these are characteristics and hallmarks of a hasood person. Number three, and this is very important, yes? They are individuals, when they are in a gathering and somebody is being praised, they are the ones who always say, but. Let's imagine, yes? You're sitting in a gathering and somebody says, you know, that person, wonderful individual, really helped us in... For example, finding a right house in Leicester, yes? Really facilitated everything. God forbid if you are a hasood, if you are an individual who is envious, what do you say at that moment? You say, but he is not somebody who is, you know, very active in the community. You're looking for negatives. You can't stand praise of others. You can't stand others being what? Talked favorably in your presence. If it is intolerable, to hear the excellence of others, then there is a problem. There is a problem, yes? If you are continuously looking to find faults, then there is a problem. Let me tell you a story. One of the Mawlanas, one of the ulama said, I was once performing Salah. Salatul what? Salatul Isha. Yes? Once I finished this particular Salah, somebody came to me who is from the congregation. I think from the congregation said to me Mawlana Sahib I said yes he said your salah is batil okay tell me why it's void he said because when you went into sajda your nose was not touching the ground Mawlana smiles looks at him and says can I ask you one question only he said yes where was your nose during this process Meaning what? If you were praying behind me, you wouldn't notice my nose was not on the ground. That means you are watching. You are looking for faults. You are looking to undermine, isn't it? There are people in many communities and societies who have PhDs in fault finding. There are people who are experts. All they want to do is bring others. This is one of the characteristics of an envious, jealous person. Yes? And therefore, it is of the utmost importance that we begin the process of what? Of refining ourselves. Somebody asks, in Islamic ethics, what are the stages of envy and hasad? Does it have stages? Yes. Number one, it's in the mind. There is a thought that comes to your mind. Number two, you feel it in your heart. Number three, you start saying things that reflects it. Number four, you do things because of it. So, how many? There are four stages of hasad. It all starts with what? Reflection and thinking about something. 
that you do not have and you do not possess or a quality that others have and you wished it to be removed. Then it creates an emotional state within you. Then you begin to speak about it to others. Then you act upon it, yes? Ulama have come forward and said, the last two, speaking about it and acting upon it is haram, is prohibited. Is that which the religion of Islam has condemned. However, does that make the first two okay? Does that make thinking and feeling acceptable? No. Why? Because when you look at narrations from the Ahl al-Bayt, you recognize that envy and hasad can actually bring about the worst in a human being and has a number of impacts on our general behavior. It creates problems in our day-to-day -day lives. A number of things are highlighted by the Ahl al-Bayt in order for us to be wary, in order for us to stand back and to appreciate the delicate, sensitive nature of this moral vice. Number one, they say, the more you think this way, the more you harbor hatred towards others. And this hatred is negative. This hatred is devastating for you. Number two, it is a factor to enhance arrogance and takabbur in the minds and the hearts of people. Number three, you begin to doubt Rabbul Alameen, Allah, God forbid. You begin to think Allah has favored someone more than me. Allah loves someone more than me. Allah has raised someone more than me. If you allow these thoughts to remain in your mind. Number four, it creates insecurity in you. You become unstable. You're constantly comparing yourself to others. You're constantly wanting things that others have. You are not content. Yes? Number five, it pulls you back from success. It's an element that's an impediment from falah and success. Number six, it creates division in community. It's a factor for disunity in society. Yes? It harbors resentment. When it comes to whom? When it comes to people generally in the community. That's why when we look at what? When we look at history, you recognize that there are ulama who have fallen due to hasad and have been at the receiving end of the la'na of the Ahl bayt because of hasad. So it means none of us should feel immune. None of us should feel that I am protected. A man by the name of Muhammad ibn Ali al shalgh Maghani. Muhammad ibn Ali al shalgh Maghani was a great scholar. Yes, at the time of the minor occultation of the Holy Twelfth Imam, Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman, Ajjalallahu ta'ala farajah al Sharif. This man was whom? Was somebody who was a narrator of hadith. He was a great scholar within the school of Ahl al-Bayt. Yes, at the time of the second representative of the Imam Muhammad ibn Uthman, he was a person who served Muhammad ibn Uthman. But the moment Muhammad ibn Uthman, Allahi ta'ala alayhi, the second representative of the Holy Twelfth Imam, died, he expected, who al Shalmaghani expected to be the third representative. But of course he wasn't chosen by the Imam. Hussein ibn Ruh was. This man became envious, jealous, started to spread rumors, started to tell people, don't follow this man, the 12th, so to speak. Started to what? Say lies. Imam alayhi salam wrote a letter and said, La'natullahi alayhi. A scholar who is on the right path descends to the worst level due to hasad and envy. But notice, that the ulama who have understood this path are aware that sometimes we have people in society who try to create discord between ulama and successful individuals by what? Suggesting hasad. I remember this beautiful story of this great individual, Sheikh Muhammad Hassan al-Najafi. He's the author of a book known as Al-Jawahir. We study it in Hawza. He's known as Sahib al-Jawahir. Yes. He was an individual who loved to wear nice clothes. Very nice clothes. He would invest whatever money he had to buy nice clothes. Yes? He was living at the time of Ayatollah al-Ansari. Ayatollah al-Ansari, very well known. Sahib al-Makasib, very well known book of fiqh. Ayatollah al-Ansari, no. He used to live very, you know, wear very simple clothes. So they came to Ayatollah al-Ansari. They said to him, how can you allow this? This scholar, yes, he wears good clothes. 
and you wear simple clothes. How is this possible? They are trying to create problems between ulama. Yes, trying to plant those seeds. Look at the answer of the ulama who are Rabbani, who are God-fearing, who understand these are plots of shaitan. They know that shaitan works through hasad. Ayatollah Ansari looks at them and says, Shaykh Muhammad Hassan al-Najafi is a man who wears this to show people Azamatul Islam, to show people that you can be a scholar, yet how great is the religion of Islam. I am somebody who wears this clothes to show people Azamatul Zuhud. I wear to show people the beauty of asceticism. We both have a role in society. These are the real scholars, yes? Who recognize what? Who recognize exactly what it should be done. That's why I remember a beautiful story. May Allah protect and indeed, indeed give long life to His Eminence Ayatollah Sistani Hafizahullah. In one particular conversation he had with one of his students, he asked him, if somebody comes and asks you a question, yes, he asks you a question, and you give him an answer, and the answer is correct, and that person is happy. How do you feel? He says, very happy. I've helped somebody, yes. He says, how about if you don't know the answer, they go to someone else that you know, and that person gives them the right answer. How do you feel? If you feel happy that the other person is giving them the right answer, then you're okay. If there is sadness in your heart, then know that deed that you were about to get reward for, and that is to give them the right answer, was not for the sake of Allah, was for your sake. If you are not satisfied for others to what help whom you are supposed to help, ultimately it doesn't matter whether you help it, them or others. Ultimately, it's about them being helped, isn't it? Yes. The recognition, therefore, that emerges is hasad is a dangerous disease. Someone asked the question, what about evil eye? Yes. Is this something that is true? Does it actually take place? Is it the same as hasad or is it different? What do we mean? We have a tradition from Amir al-Mu'mineen in Najjul Balagha that says, al ayn haqq that evil eye does actually take place. And ulama said evil eye is amongst those characteristics of a hasid. Meaning what? A person who is envious cannot hurt others. They hurt themselves. Except if they practice evil eye. And there are those who are able to do so. Yes. This great lady Asma bint Umais. Radhwanullahi ta'ala alayha. One of our great ladies in the religion of Islam. You know, Asma bint Umais was married to Ja'far al-Tayyar. He was martyred. She then married the first Khalifa Abu Bakr. Yet she stood against her husband in support of Ali Muhammad and to be next to Sayyidatun Nisa because there is nothing greater than the wilaya of Ali Muhammad. Yes, this great lady would support Sayyida Fatima and was the last person to see her alive according to some narrations. Asma bint Umais comes to Rasulullah and says to him, Ya Rasulullah, there are those who have told me that there are people who are casting the evil eye, Nazar, on my children. Does this exist? The Prophet affirmed, said, yes, it exists. The recognition that emerges is what? Is that the evil eye, according to many scholars, is a reality. And it can indeed cause harm. Whereas hasad by itself unless people act upon it, the fourth level, does not, yes? And therefore, there are those who ask the question, is this something that happens all the time? Because if there are problems in marriage, they always blame it on evil eye. If the business is not going well, evil eye. COVID-19, evil eye. Leicester finish fifth in the league, evil eye. Yes? Many times they come forward and they say, everything is related to evil eye it exists but it has limited yes it is very limited someone asks how do i become an individual who what who refines myself from hasad from god forbid acting upon envy and jealousy 
These are the recommendations, practical lessons we can take home and inshallah begin to apply them into our lives. Number one, do not delay. If you feel that you have this tendency within you, start the process of reflection and change. Do not say one day, inshallah, when I feel correct and when I'm in the right state of mind, I will begin to change. No. Number two, it's a struggle. You must ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help and assistance in this. Number three, think. What is the reason that you are envious of an individual? The background is likely that we have misunderstood the rizq and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala distributes all the favors and blessings that he has given. And when I am cognizant of this realization, then perhaps things will begin to fall into place. Number four, beautiful tip, please focus on this, and that is every time you think to become envious of someone, do the opposite and pray for them. Try it, yes? You think, oh, that person, mashallah, he recited an amazing qasida, wonderful marcia, I wish I had his voice, no problem. This is called ghibta in Islam. Ghibta is allowed. When you want something that others have, that's it. This is okay. Actually, some ulama have said it's mustahab. What is haram is that you say, I wish there's something that happens to their voice. That is what is haram, yes? I don't like them to be so successful. Yes, that is haram, right? If God forbid you have those feelings, that is the moment. Raise your hands. Say, Ya Allah, make their voice even more beautiful. Because you all heard the story at the time of the messenger of God. He said, that man is of the people of Jannah. Somebody goes to him, lives with him three days, sees that he prays, he does everything. When, after three days, he doesn't see that he does something exceptional, asks him, do you do something extra? He says, no, I pray, I go to work. He said, tell me, you must do something as special. He said, one thing that I've trained my life, every time I see something that others have, they don't have, I say, Ya Allah, give them more and intensify the risk for them. Prophet of Islam says, because of this, they are of the people of Jannah. Number five, if this doesn't work, then remember, there is specific punishment for hasad that is mentioned what in hadith. For example, it's one of the causes of the squeezing of the grave. One of the causes for the pain and torment and punishment in alam al-barzakh. Sometimes these become what? These become impediments that stop us from doing this. Someone says, how do I protect myself from the evil eye or the hasad? of people, there are a number of a'mal to do. For example, to recite ma'udhatayn, yes? Surah Al-Falaq, Surah Al-Nas. For example, to recite Ayatul Kursi. For instance, to give sadaqa. For instance, narrations tell us, continuously people must be of Ahlus Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. How magnificent is this salawat? Similarly, ulama say, you don't need to tell the whole world about what you have. Hold back a little bit. Yes? Especially, and I see this to those brothers and sisters who are not married yet. Because we did this experiment in one of the courses that we do for marriage. We said to those who are looking to get married, look at the Facebook profiles or Instagram of those and any individual and the moment they pressed on that profile, they saw the pictures, they saw the poses, they saw the boasting. They said, no, 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 we're not interested. They're too materialistic, yes? What impression, number one, you're giving to those that perhaps are considering you as a spouse? But more importantly and more detrimentally, how would you feel if the imam of our time checks your profile? Yes? Social media, the currency for it is attention, no doubt. I understand. But hold back from the urgent or the tendency or the temptation to place everything that you own and everywhere that you go and every good thing that happens to you in front of others so that everyone says, wow, amazing that you have this. You are exposing yourself to hasad more. This doesn't mean that you have a blessing that you shouldn't tell people about it, but be reasonable. Yes, that is of the utmost importance. Yet when you come to the Quran, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us of an ayah of great importance that demonstrates how a particular group of people have been subjected to hasad like no other. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is in chapter 4 of the Holy Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah. In Surah Al-Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah 54, أَمْ يَحْسُدُونَ النَّاسَ عَلَى مَا آتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ Oh, people practicing hasad because what we have given people out of the virtues and the blessings of the Almighty Allah says are you really practicing hasad then he goes on to talk about this group of people فَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا آلَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَآتَيْنَاهُمْ مُلْكًا عَظِيمًا Allah says we have given the family of Ibrahim the book and hikmah very well but we have given them a great kingdom, Mulkan Azima. I ask you, when you look at the story of Sulaiman and Dawood, Allah says we have been giving them Mulk. Doesn't say Mulkan Azima. Does it say a great kingdom? Yes. Doesn't talk about that kingdom physically to Sulaiman and Dawood. Yes. You look at the ahadith that we have. Yes from the Ahl al-Bayt, for example, Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. In al-Kafi, he says, Nahnu wallahi al-Mahsudun. We are the people the Quran is talking about. We are the ones that are envied the most by people. Yes? This Emphasis is found in more than 20 ahadith in the book Nur al Thaqalain, in more than 20 in the book Burhan, in more than 60 narrations in Biharul Anwar. All of these they come forward and say, Mulkan Azima is what the great kingdom is nothing other than the wilaya of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. The narration says, Al Mulkul Azim and Ja'ala Fihim a immatan man ata'ahum ata'allah. The great kingdom, the Quran says, is the fact that they are Imams. Whomsoever obeys them obeys Allah. Whomsoever disobeys them disobey Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how powerful is the wilaya of Ali Muhammad? How amazing are these holy individuals. The Quran says we have bestowed upon them this magnificent kingdom. They have indeed won the hearts and minds of others. The sixth holy imam was asked once by an individual, Ya ibn Rasulillah, I want you to ask Allah that I am with you in Jannah. Imam al-Sadiq looks at him and says, I'm going to ask Allah not to take you out of Jannah. The man was surprised. He was bewildered. He is living in this world. How is it that the sixth Imam is saying, I am going to ask Allah that you are not removed from Jannah? He questions. He asks, Ya ibn Rasulillah, how is this so? Imam al-Sadiq replies, Wilayatuna hi al-Jannah. Our wilaya is paradise. Is Jannah. If only people understood. When we gather in Muharram, when we shed the tears, when we remember Ahl al Bayt, when we gather in Majalis, Wallah, this is one of the greatest blessings Allah has given us. One of the magnificent gifts from Allah. Sallallahu Do not underestimate it. Now that pandemic is slowly, what Alhamdulillah, becoming less and less effective. And may Allah protect all Mu'mineen and Mu'minat. But attendance in majalis attendance in the commemoration of ali muhammad should not be taken lightly this is a pleasure a treasure and a means of blessing from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just by attending you're encapsulated by the grace and mercy of allah and malaika pray for you and you are at the receiving end of the shafa of ali muhammad do not underestimate the thawab and the reward of taking place in the majalis of the Ahl al-Bayt. This great treasure, the Quran says, is wilaya. This great individuals are the Ahl al-Bayt, alayhum salam Yes, and that is why Muharram and the remembrance of the tragedy of the 10th 
brings us closer to these individuals is the establishment of the wilaya of Ahl al-Bayt. Wallah Ashura is the battle between Wilayatullah and Wilayatul Shaytan. There is the army of truth and haqq, yes? And there is the army of falsehood. There is the army that leads you to Jannah and there is the army that leads you to hell and Jahannam. And Karbala is the university of wilaya. Is the university that gets you closer to Allah. And there are principles and values, yes? When it came to shedding the blood of Hussein, these individuals looked at Aba Abdullah and were envious of him, were jealous of him. There was no man alive like Hussein ibn Ali. He stood there on the 10th. He said to them, have I hurt any one of you? He wore the turban of Rasulullah. He had the sword of Rasulullah. He had the cloak of Rasulullah. He said, is there anyone amongst you whom I have usurped their rights? Is there anyone in the world that is the grandson of the Prophet like me? Yet they perpetrated the most heinous of crimes. And this realization of gaining Shahada on the 10th and uplifting the morals of mankind as we are seeking to do in Ashura and the commemoration of Muharram was in the minds of Aba Abdullah as he was leaving Madinatul Munawwara. That was a painful farewell. Medina was beloved to the Ahl al-Bayt. Here was Sayyid al-Shuhada having to leave the city for the final time. The narrations tell us the first thing he did, he went to the mosque of the Prophet and he did the ziyara of Rasulullah. And he began to speak to his beloved grandfather. And he began indeed to tell him of his pains of how the Ummah have turned against the principles of Islam. Yes. He came back the next day and he did the ziyara again. And this time he fell asleep on the grave of Rasulullah. When he fell asleep, he saw the messenger in his dream. Rasulullah embraced Imam al Hussein. He said to him, my grandson Hussein, there is a position that Allah has indeed saved for you. You will only attain it through shahada. Imam al Hussein said, Jaddah, Ya Rasulallah, Dhummani ilayk, take me towards you. I don't want to go back to this world, yes. But the Prophet of Islam would say to him, Your father, your mother, your brother are all waiting for you. Yes. You will soon join us, O Hussein. Aba Abdullah wakes up. Do you know whom he went to visit next? The grave of his mother, Fatima to Zahra. The hidden grave of Sayyidatun Nisa. He goes and sheds the tears. Umma Fatima, this is the wada. Umma Fatima, this is the farewell. Then he prepares his family members. He bids farewell to the grave of Imam al Hassan al Mujtaba in Baqir. Then he looks around trying to organize his family members. They're about to set off, then he hears a little girl. This little girl, her name is Fatima. She was ill. She was not able to join Imam in his caravan. Yes, he looks behind and she says to him, Father Abba Abdullah, is this the final farewell? Imam al Hussein, this is the first of his children that he has to bid farewell, yes, to. Uh, he comes and embraces her, he kisses her, yes. He hugs her, he asks her to be patient. Uh, one narration says, this young girl said to her father, Father Hussein, I beg you, leave me my brother Ali and al Azhar. Do not take Ali and al Azhar. I want to him to be next to me. I ask you not to take Ali and al Azhar with me. Aba Abdullah knew 
What status Ali and Al Azgar would reach, yes? Uh, and therefore he reached Karbala on the second of Muharram, yes, a day like tomorrow. When he reached Karbala, he asked them, What is this area? They said to him, This is called Ghadiriya. He said, Has it got another name? They said, No. He said, You must know that there is another name. They said, This is called Nainawa. He said, Does it have a third name? They said, This is the land of Karbala. He immediately said, Allahumma illa na nashku ilayka min al karbi wal bala. Ya Allah, we seek your protection from calamities and hardship. At that moment, Imam al Hussein said something. He said, Ha huna mahattu rijaluna. This is where we will sit down. Ha huna tuhraku khiyamuna. This is where our tents will be set on fire. Ha huna yuqtalu rijaluna. This is where our men will be slaughtered. Hahuna yuzbahu atfaluna. This is where our children will be killed. On the 10th of Muharram, when Aba Abdullah looked on the right and the left and all his companions and all his family were slaughtered, he gains a letter. This letter is from his daughter Fatima. He opens the letter. The tears trickle from his eyes. The letter says, Abatah ya Hussein, I miss you Father Hussein. Tell me of the news of Akbar and Azhar. Tell me of the news of Abbas and Qasim. Imam says, uh, Oh family of Rasulullah, my daughter is asking about Abbas. My daughter is asking where is Qasim and where is Akbar. <laughs> On the day of Arba'in, this land of Karbala, this soil of Karbala, so so many calamities, yes? Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari, he is blind. He says to his servant Atiyah, hold my hand, take me to the grave of my beloved Hussein. Yes. When he is approaching the grave of Aba Abdullah, the narrations tell us he lets go of the hand of Atiyah and runs towards the grave of Hussein. They later asked him, how did you find the grave of Aba Abdullah? He said, I smell the fragrance of Qabr al Hussein. When he reaches the grave of Aba Abdullah, he throws himself on the grave, on the soil of his beloved, and he cries out, Hussein, Hussein, Hussein. He cries out the name of his beloved Imam, Habibun la yujibu Habib. You are my beloved. Why is it that you're not responding to me? Then he says a line that breaks the heart of a believer breaks the heart of the lover of Hussein he says my beloved how can you answer when your head has been separated from you how can you answer when your cheeks have been crushed how can you answer when your chest has been trampled upon at that moment this man, Jabir ibn Abdullah, his head is on the grave of Aba Abdullah. He is crying. Yes, this is the soul of Karbala. He hears some group of people coming. He says, Atiyah, go and see who these people are. If they are the Ahl al-Bayt, you are free for the sake of Allah. Atiyah returns. He says, my master Jabir, Qum wastaqbil sabaya Rasulillah. Go and stand. Welcome the captives of the family of the Prophet. Jabir stands. Now Imam Zain al-Abideen walks towards Jabir ibn Abdullah. Yes, Imam Zain al-Abideen is now in Karbala. Sayyida Zainab is now in Karbala. They now look around them. There is so much emotion. There is so much grief. There are those who have thrown themselves on the graves of their loved ones. Imam Zain al-Abideen comes to Jabir. He says the same thing as his father. Yes, he says, oh Jabir, oh Jabir. 
الأمر هنا قتل رجالنا It is here that we lost our men هنا ذبح أطفالنا It is here that our children have been slaughtered أجركم الله Then he says something that Imam Al-Hussein does not say Wallah it breaks the heart to say the following He holds the hand of, of Jabir and he walks towards a place Jabir is unable to see Imam Zain Al-Abideen walks towards that place All of a sudden his steps become shorter He begins to cry profusely Then Jabir says my master Zain Al-Abideen Where are we in Karbala? Imam says Huna jalas al-shimr ala sadr al Hussein. It is here that Shimr said <laughs> Jabir wonders why is Aba Abdullah not buried where he was martyred? He asks Imam Zain al Abidin. Imam, when he's crying, says, Jabir, his body was moved and trampled. His bones were crushed left and right. Allah, 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 وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي من قلب ينقلب والعاقبة للمتقين وإنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون يسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم العز الأجل الأكرم يا الله يا رب العالمين يا أرحم الراحمين تقبل منا يا الله Oh Allah we ask you and beseech you and sincerely pray to you to allow us to reform our souls and our behavior if if there are anyone amongst us who is exhibiting features or characteristics of envious individuals ya allah allow us to defeat these vices ya rabbal alameen allow this muharram to be a time in which we get close to you through aba abdullah al hussein ya allah accept our deeds accept our aza accept our tears from the Nasaib of the 10th of Muharram. Ya Rabbil Alameen, we beg you and beseech you, make us of the zuwar of Aba Abdullah al Hussein and allow us to attain his shafa'a on the day of Qiyamah. Ma'atama Hussein, Ya Hussein, 